We'll consider the last topics of the chapter, which has to do with the amount of a gas expressed in N, the mole or amount of the gas. Up until now, we've looked at three properties which can describe a gas, and those were temperature, volume, and pressure. Boyle's Law was about the relationship between volume and pressure. It's an inverse relationship. Increased pressure, volume decreases. And Charles' Law was a direct relationship. Increase the temperature, the volume will increase. Both of these laws were based upon the number of moles being held constant. And so the point would be that how is it that all different gases behave in the same way under <clears throat> pressure, for example? Or why should all gases behave in the same way when they are heated? Well, it's based upon a very important principle that Avogadro had a lot to do with, and that you can look at equal volumes of different gases under the same conditions of temperature and pressure and show mathematically that they have the same number of particles. This also led to a very important concept called the molar volume. So let's define what standard temperature and pressure is first before we continue with these two key concepts of this podcast. Standard temperature is officially defined as zero degrees Celsius. Look for that on a test question. If you turn that into Kelvin, of course, that's 273K. Standard pressure has been described as one atmosphere, which of course can be re-expressed as 760 millimeters or 29.95 inches, etc. So make sure you know that standard temperature and pressure, zero Celsius and uh, one atmosphere, are, have to be used when you want to compare gases because clearly if you change any of the conditions of temperature or pressure or volume, then the gases will respond in, in the same. So it's, you've got to have a way to compare gases under the same conditions. So one of the things that led early gas law researchers to theorize that equal volumes of a gas have the same number of particles was that they noticed there was a very interesting relationship between volume and the stoichiometry of gases. So you could take two volumes of hydrogen, could be one liter, could be one milliliter, react it with one volume of oxygen, one milliliter, one liter, and you end up with two volumes of water vapor. Now interestingly enough, it's not like two plus one equals three, 2 plus 1 equal 2 because they understood, although they couldn't actually prove it yet, that there must be these things called atoms and that those atoms could possibly combine into molecules which can split and recombine into different numbers of atoms and or molecules. The point would be that no matter what gas you used in whatever reaction, the ratios with which they combined with each other were always small whole number volumes or whole number, uh, number ratios. So <clears throat> this is giving them a clue not only about the number of particles that are in a gas, but also that the subatomic or the atomic um, structure of matter could be explained by using gases. So this is hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And it didn't again matter what the gases were that were reacting with each other. You still got these same small whole number ratios. <clears throat> so Avogadro said that the volume of a gas, as long as the pressure is constant and, and the temperature is constant, the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the number of moles of the gas. Well, that makes sense. The, the greater the number of moles of something you have, the more space it is that it's going to take up. As long as you keep the temperature and pressure constant as you're comparing one gas to another. And mathematically, you can express that as volume equals a constant times n. Or another way to say that is volume divided by the number of moles always equal to constant. So if we make the number of moles get bigger, then the volume gets bigger, as long as this number k is a constant, which it is. Now, Avogadro's hypothesis went on to include, then, another very key concept that equal volumes of different gases under the same conditions of temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. Let's fine-tune that a little bit. 
Here we're looking at five or six different color boxes, each representing different diatomic elements, such as in the case of hydrogen, or monatomic elements like helium, or even molecules of compounds like carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide. And it doesn't matter what the identity of the gas is. If you have these gases in the same size of a box at the same conditions of temperature and pressure, then they'll have the same number of particles inside. And that has to do with the kinetic molecular theory, which says gas particles are so far apart from each other that there's plenty of elbow room in there. And secondly, that the volume of each individual gas particle molecule or atom is nothing relative to the incredibly huge size of the container that they are trapped in. So this has a corollary to it, and it's a very important one. It's called the molar volume. Notice that similar kind of concept here, but now we're going to fine-tune it, that if you have <coughs> a volume that's equal to 22.4 liters, and if you are under conditions that are standard, one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius, then each of these little manometer bulbs here contain a mole worth of particles, whether they're made up of atoms of helium, or molecules of the element nitrogen, or molecules of the compound methane. So they're totally different gases, but if I trap them in a container that's 22.4 liters of space, that's got 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles in it, long as you're under standard conditions. What's very important to notice, though, is that they do not weigh the same. And from this, we were able to derive the relative masses of elements atoms to each other. They can have the same number of particles. A dozen donuts is the same number as a dozen bowling balls, but <clears throat> a dozen donuts doesn't weigh the same as a dozen bowling balls. So they're able to have determined the relative masses of the atoms of the elements to each other by early work done with gases. Now this is about as far as we need to go into the depth of understanding on this molar volume. <coughs> but it's a really important tool because you can now go from liters into moles or moles into liters, which could then turn into grams if you want to do gas stoichiometry problems. And we'll be doing that after we complete this little mini unit here. But it does bring up the point about what is ideal. And so what we said was there's this fake imaginary gas that our points that have no volume, they have no attraction for each other, no repulsion for each other, and we call those an ideal gas. In reality, gases do have volume. Gases do sometimes have attractive forces for each other, but they have to be under special conditions. So let's take a look at those. <coughs> if I want a gas to behave ideally, you put them under low pressure so that they are far away from each other, basically. A bigger volume would allow that to happen. And you let them be at high temperature. So they're bebopping around so fast in the container that they can't stop and take a glance at the molecule nearby. So gases, real gases, act more ideally, more like this fake gas that has particles with no volume. If you put them under low pressure, you're not cramming them close to each other, and high temperature. They can zip around at rapid velocities without paying any attention to the molecules nearby. But a real gas does act like there are attractions for particles for each other, and in doing so, they can actually turn into a liquid. Our model that we're going to do on our Charles Law Lab is going to say, oh, an ideal gas at what temperature has zero volume. That is, if you took a fake ideal gas and cooled it down, you could get it to just shrink into nothingness and turn into nothingness, not into a liquid like the matter normally would. But if you take a real gas and you do this to it, you cram them close to each other, you squeeze them so they're really close to other atoms nearby or molecules nearby, 
that would happen under high pressure. And at that point, if you can slow them down, that is, make the temperature a low temperature, now there will be attractive forces between the two particles. And when that happens, far spread apart gas molecules can liquefy and actually, because of forces of attraction for each other, become a liquid. So in reality, <coughs> the laws that you've been studying, Charles, Boyles, Gay-Lussac, and this one that's coming up now, the ideal gas law, they're based upon a gas that doesn't exist. And mathematically, it works pretty well under most conditions. But in reality, you can chill a gas and pressurize it. And you've seen this in real life, although you may not have known it, whenever you followed a tanker truck down the freeway that's got LN2 on the side. That's a tanker truck full of liquid nitrogen. And the way they've turned it into a liquid is to compress it and cool it to a very, very, very cold temperature. Now there's an interesting law called the ideal gas law, which I've already introduced in class, but we'll go over now, which is called the Pivnert. And it takes all four of the factors, pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature, and it connects them by using this guy, the gas law constant. The gas law constant's value is a number that can change depending upon what the pressure measurement is in. If your pressure measurement is going to be in millimeters of mercury, then you have to use this number. If your pressure measurement is going to be in atmospheres, now your gas law constant has to be 0.0821. And what these funny units are that are right here are simply units that allow us to combine volume, uh, temperature, number of moles, and pressure to get all of the units to cancel out that you don't want as you solve for the one that you do. Now, where did these numbers 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin or 62.4 millimeters mercury per liter per mole Kelvin, where did those come from? Let's take a look at how you can derive those. <clears throat> Notice that there is a chart here first of all, and there's one or two more we haven't shown you yet. Here's the one that you'll be using if you have kilopascals, 8.314. We don't use this one very much. <clears throat> and the one we're working with, we're going to round 0.0821 is the number you use for atmospheres, and we round to 62.4 for if it's in millimeters or torr. Well, this constant of proportionality that relates them all was derived by pretending that you had an ideal gas. So if you take PV equals nRT and rearrange it to solve for R, pressure times volume divided by number of moles times temperature, if you sub in that you're at standard condition, 760 millimeters, you have a volume of 22.4 liters because you assumed you had one mole, and you assume you're at zero Celsius or 273 Kelvin, that's where that number 62.4 came from. If you assume ideal conditions and standard conditions for, let's say, using atmospheres, <coughs> now when we solve for R, that's where the 0.0821 came from. So it's a number like pi that in geometry relates all the parts of circles together, radii and circumference and so on, and it ties together pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles and allows you to cancel out the units you are not solving for and retain the unit you are. So if I was to encounter a problem and I'm not sure which gas law it applies to, I'd make a list. Now if I didn't know that this was a PV equals NRT, my list would say V equals 2.00, P equals 1.00 atmosphere. T equals 273 plus 15, looks like N is the unknown. Now it's showing here that you could just substitute in the values as written, but I strongly recommend you do your algebra with the symbols first and makes your math so much sim simpler. If PV equals NRT, PV divided by RT equals N. Now you can sub it in the way that it shows here on this particular problem. I would fault this problem because we didn't show the units for the gas constant, and I think that was the only thing that's shown here. When you solve, as I showed you on the whiteboard in class the other day, 
when the units of the gas constant are placed here, you will find that they will cancel out everything, liters and atmospheres, and in this case, the forgotten K for Kelvin, so that the only unit you would be left with would be the number of moles. And again, a little sloppy with the sig figs, because in the problem there was 1.00 atmospheres, and down here we just show one. But since all the values had three numbers in them, we're going to call that 0.0846 moles. So PIVNERT allows you to solve for either pressure, volume, number of moles, or temperature, as long as you know the gas constant to use and the conditions that you're under. Four out of the five values will be given, and the fifth one you find through basic algebra. Now if someone was to ask you the mass of the propane in the tank, and this is where PIVNERT can turn into grams, or grams can turn into PIVNERT, Simply take your number of moles and multiply it by the molar mass of the substance. A lot of times the PIVNERT problems start with grams, which of course you have to turn into moles and then you'll have your N. Or sometimes we have you solve for, and oh by the way, and this is a major typo, that's not an N, that's a mass equals 3.72 grams, not N. But sometimes what will also happen is that once you solve for the number of moles of something, they might ask you for its numbers of atoms or its numbers of molecules. Well, that's easy. Just go back in and insert the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles in a mole of anything. So that wraps up our discussion of gases and the mole. You'll have a number of worksheets on PV equals NRT, and then we'll take it to our last level, the very simple gas stoichiometry. Take care.